Good morning, church. Welcome to our online service for Sunday, April 5th. Before we turn this over to Pastor Randy, let me read you a few announcements. As you have heard or read, President Trump has asked that all Americans continue social distancing. So what does that mean for our church? We will continue to monitor the situation closely. We will continue to have our online worship services, and we will update you weekly on Wednesdays as to our status. As of today, all activities at our building are canceled or postponed through Sunday, April 12th. The exception is the food pantry, which will remain open on Wednesdays from 3.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. It's also very encouraging to see that many of our small groups and ministries are connecting online via Zoom or Skype. We're also keeping the church office open on Tuesdays through Fridays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. If you have any needs or questions, please do not hesitate to call 732-938-3111. Dawn will continue to email the Vine on Wednesday afternoons. Please take the time to pray through the issues and needs that are listed in the Vine. You can also let us know of any prayer requests by emailing them to office at jerseygrace.org or you can text them to the attendance number 908-489-2036. We will get your request to the Women's Intercessory Prayer Group and I will also forward them to your Shepherding Sphere Elder. And now if you would, please turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke and let us focus our minds and our hearts on God. As it says in 1 Chronicles 16.23, Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Here's Pastor Randy. Hello, Grace Bible Church family. Pastor Randy here, and as you know, this is now our fourth week of conducting home church. Looks like this might be going on a little longer, but I am receiving good reports, and I understand that from what we can tell, all of you are staying spiritually strong. It is our desire that these um, Sunday morning services via the internet are simply an overflow of what you and your family are doing throughout the week, that you're in the Word, that you're praying, that you're serving other people as much as that is possible, that you are sharing your faith with other people, uh, that you are meeting uh, over the internet, as I understand. And uh, with that in mind, there's been some um, questions about Resurrection Sunday and Good Friday and even the Lord's Table. We are talking about that as a staff. Hopefully this coming week, we'll give you some more information about some special things we can do. Of course, we will not have the opportunity to meet collectively together in person. This is a tough time for everybody. It's hard for you. It's hard for me. Some people have it really bad. Um, overall, the economy is tanking. Uh, people are being laid off. Uh, money is tight. School is canceled. The plans have been changed. And that is resulting in a lot of um, fear, boredom, tension, frustration, anger, uh, anxiety. And the question is, what are we doing about that? Um, I was driving to work, I think it was yesterday, and I noticed a sign in a house not too far from the church that said hope. And I, I, the homeowners mean well by that. Uh, I'm sure it was there to encourage the morale of the community. But the question I, as I drove past it, I had to ask myself is, um, hope, hope in what? Uh, we're all going through tough times and, and hope is, is, is a good thing, but, but what is the object of our hope? Is it in um, just good luck that things will pass, fate, chance? Is it in the goodness of humanity? Is it in mother nature? Is it in medical professionals? Is it in politicians? Of course, some of these will help and provide some hope, but there's no ultimate hope in any of those. Here's where the ultimate hope comes. Check this out. Isaiah 45. There is no other God besides me, a righteous God 
and a Savior. There's none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness, and I will not turn back. That to me, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. They will say of me, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength. Men will come to him, and all who are angry at him will be put to shame. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel will be justified and will glory. My friends, our ultimate hope, and I, I think you know this, is, is not in all those other things. Our ultimate hope is in the fact that there is a God and that he is on the throne and that he is sovereign, which means that he is in control of all the things that are happening right now and that he has a plan in all of this and it is all working together for our ultimate good and his ultimate glory. Isaiah 55, 11, his word never returns void. Romans eleven thirty four. no one is his counselor. He does according to his will, Daniel four thirty five. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, Psalm 24, 1. When God sets out to do something, he will always bring his plans to pass. For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever, Romans eleven thirty six. God wills in perfect wisdom and God acts in perfect omnipotence. So why don't you pause the video right now, and if you're alone, just think this through by yourself. If you're with a group of people, um, go ahead and discuss it. This will be the first of our three discussion questions. And talk about what you are doing right now during this time of trial to bring hope in God. Go ahead and do that now. Well, the title of this sermon, as you can see, is Jesus Brings Results. Jesus brings results in all that he does. He's a God that achieves results. Specifically, let's take creation. When God set out to make a world, he brought immediate results. And when God brings salvation to people, he brings results. He is recreating them into the image of Christ. When people are saved, there are results. They're being changed into the likeness of Jesus. And a great example was what we saw last week. Let's keep all these things in context. In that person named Zacchaeus, he was a greedy guy He was immoral. He was a thief. And in an instant, in the span of just an hour, maybe, with a conversation with Jesus, really ultimately instantaneously, when his heart was changed, this guy becomes a cheerful giver. This guy has a heart for the poor. And this guy wants to right all the wrongs that he's committed in his life. In chapter 9, or chapter uh, 19, verse 9, Jesus says this regarding Zacchaeus. Today, salvation has come to this house. And the timing of that is very significant. I'm sure there was somewhere along the line when Zacchaeus made a proclamation as a result of the gospel presentation by Jesus that he was giving his life, he was trusting in Christ to be his Lord and his Savior. But what I find very fascinating, as I mentioned to you last week, that Jesus did not pronounce his salvation upon Zacchaeus in verse 9 until Zacchaeus made evidence of his repentance regarding his life in verse 8. When Christ saves a person, there's evidence of his presence. There is power that is on display. When Jesus saves people, he brings results. Now, the way I look at it, there's only three types of people in the world. There are people that are haters. They just clearly hate God. And then there's people that are fakers, where they they think they love God, or maybe they don't love God, but they're just putting on a show for other people. And then there's genuine believers. And the only way to tell if in your own heart, whether or not you are genuine as compared to a faker or a hater, is the spiritual fruit that is produced in your life. Or coming back to the fact that Jesus brings results. Everyone on the planet will find him or herself in one of those three categories. So with a lengthy introduction, let's dive into things. We have three sermon points this morning. Number one will be two different historical facts. The second point will be a look at one parable. And the third point will be looking at these three people groups, the haters, the fakers, and the genuine believers. 
What's the main point? Same as the title. Jesus always brings results. Let's begin with the first point, two historical points. Look with me, if you would, at verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So according to verse 11, we learn two things. Number one, that Jesus is presenting a parable. We'll come back to that in a minute. And also that he is approaching Jerusalem. Now, as we've mentioned in the past, the belief was that the Messiah was going to come and do amazing things to set up his kingdom. And that would happen when he came into Jerusalem. So as Jesus is now approaching Jerusalem, the expectations for Jesus to act are very high. The political expectations that he'd overthrow Roman occupation, that he'd restore Israel back to her supremacy and so forth and so on. So here comes Jesus moving toward Jerusalem. So it's natural that many people, verse 11, supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear, as the text says, immediately. Yes, Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to secure a kingdom, but no, it was not a kingdom that they had imagined in their own minds as they expected according to their tradition. Jesus would not enter Jerusalem as the rider on the white horse. He would not come as the military leader uh, on a chariot. But rather, we know that Jesus would come as a humble man, riding a donkey of all things. He would come as the the sacrificial lamb of God, who would come not to set up this kingdom and to slay all of his enemies that everybody could see and sit on a throne, but rather he would come to go to a cross and die for the sins of his people. Again, in context, what was his mission at this point? Verse 10, the prior verse, to seek and to save that which was lost. The kingdom will come in power, but not in the way that they expected right now. That will have to wait. But yes, the kingdom right now will also come in power because he will establish for himself a kingdom where he rules in people's lives. And he will show that power in their lives no different than what we saw last week in the example of Zacchaeus. Again, Jesus when he does something, brings results. A second historical fact that is very interesting uh, plays off of verse 12. Let me read that. So he begins his parable and he says this. So Jesus said, a nobleman, uh, a leader, a respected person, a king, we could say, went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then come back, then to return. So we learn right now that this is not a a true story, in a sense. It's a fictitious story. It's a parable. A parable, as we said, is using an, an earthly story that everybody would be familiar with and then tying a spiritual lesson to it. So he is basing this off, I believe, a current event. And it was an event that happened right around that time that all the people would have been very familiar with. We know that when Jesus was born, the king of Israel was a wicked man named Herod. He's the one that wanted all the babies dead. He's the one that wanted to kill Jesus. He's the reason that they were told to to flee to Egypt. Well, Herod died not not long after Jesus was born. And then after Herod died, what he did was he left a will. And it was his desire that his empire, which ruled over all of Israel, would be split amongst his three sons. Caesar Augustus was the leader in charge of Rome at that time. And the way it worked was Archelaus, one of the three sons, went to Caesar Augustus to receive this kingdom. So again, you with me on the story. He left his land, went to a distant country, went to Rome to receive this kingdom, to follow in the footsteps of leadership like his dad, Herod. Caesar Augustus was... Uh, in a desire, as I said, to honor the will of Herod, but yet didn't feel Archelaus was the best man for this position. So he did not confer upon him the title king, but rather the title ethnarch, and gave him jurisdiction over three provinces, Idumea, Samaria, and Judea, after this visit with Herod. He comes back. He rules. Israel did not like Archelaus. 
So what they do is they set up a delegation, like we see here in verse 12, and they go to Rome and they protest this guy's cruel leadership. And according to history, in 6 AD, Caesar Augustus judged Archelaus incompetent to rule and removed him from power. Now, keep that in mind as we study the rest of this parable. All right, second point, one parable. So with the history explained, I think now we can make a little bit more sense of this parable. Let me read verse 12 again. A nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. So just like Archelaus, who left Israel, went to Rome, that would be the the distant country, to receive from Caesar a, a rule, a kingdom for himself, Jesus did the same thing. He left this world, went to a distant country, that would be heaven, after his work on the cross, to receive a kingdom for himself from the Father. Archelaus from Caesar, Jesus from Father. Um, Of course, Jesus is always Lord and King. But what the Bible teaches is that in a special way, he is acknowledged as Lord and King as a result of his work that he accomplished on the cross. For example, Romans 1 tells us this, that he was declared son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. So in a sense, things changed after the work of the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Or Philippians 2, as a result of the cross, God the Father highly exalted Christ and bestowed upon him the name which is above every name. And then Jesus is coming back. He is returning, as verse 12 says. In a sense, he returned in a uh, quiet way, uh, in an unseen way would be a better word, through the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He would come and he would, in the power of the Holy Spirit, take up residence in people's hearts, where some people on this planet will submit to Jesus as Lord, as Master, as King. But what we're really getting at here is the second coming, when Jesus will return in bodily form, when he will come back and he will set up his power for all to see. And at that point, not just some will acknowledge him as Lord, but all will bow the knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Another comparison that I find very fascinating is just as Israel sent that delegation over to Rome in opposition to Archelaus. Verse 14 says this, the citizens hated him. Again, I think a reference here in the parable to Jesus and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to rule over us. Now, there was good reason to have Archelaus removed. Historians will tell us that he massacred 3,000 of his own Jewish people. And they wanted him out of there. But what's interesting is, what reason was there to send a delegation to get Jesus removed in that sense? Why did people hate him so much? He said it himself in John 15, 25, that they hated me without cause. And we know this is exactly what happened. It wasn't long after this account that he is arriving in Jerusalem. We have the events of the Passion Week. And what do we read in John 19, 15? The crowd yelling, away with him, away with him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Again, if I'm interpreting this correctly, do you see the parable? Well, let's dig into the parable right now. We have this king. uh, It's called a nobleman in my translation. I believe this is represented by Jesus while on earth, before he returns, the ascension goes back to heaven to be with the Father in glory. Verse 13 says he calls for himself 10 of his slaves, or we could say it's just a general word, doulos, a, a servants, uh, workers. He calls 10 of his workers together and he gives them 10 minus and says to them, do business with this until I come back. So the king leaves, but just before he leaves, he calls together 10 of his servants. He has 10 minas in his hand. And he gives each servant one mina. And the goal is to take his money while he is gone and make more money for the king. To do business, as the text says. Now, um, we're going to get to in a minute 
there is a comparison of this parable to the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. I believe they are totally two different parables given on different occasions. But there is a comparison. A talent was a lot of money. Uh, I've read this week that a mina was about one-sixteenth of a talent, so a lot less than a talent. It was about three months' wage. But the bottom line is each servant is called, there's ten of them, they're each given a mina, and they're told to do business, to make an investment on behalf of the master. Because the master one day will come back, and there will be a time when each person will have to give an account as to how well they did with the resources that were entrusted to each servant. And that day of reckoning happens in verse 15. Three of the ten we see here are called into account by the master. Verses 16 and 17. The first appeared, saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And the master said to him, Well done, good slave, because you've been faithful in a very little thing, you are to be have an authority over ten cities. He was rewarded greatly, right, for his faithfulness. And then there's the second one in 18 and 19. The second one came saying, your mina master has made five minas. And he said to him, you are to be over five cities. Again, a little less, but still a good servant rewarded for his faithfulness. And then here comes the third servant, verses 20 to 21. Another came saying, Master, here's your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and you reap what you did not sow. In a nutshell, you know what he's saying? He's saying this, Master, you're a thief. You don't plant, but you reap someone else's harvest. And then you take credit for it as if it were your own. You are a predator. And because you're a predator, I fear you. And therefore, I did nothing with your mina. Master's response, verses 22 to 23. He said to him, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I'm an exacting man taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. This guy was extremely lazy. It would not have been very difficult for him just to invest it in the bank. As a matter of fact, the rabbis would, would say that one of the worst ways to hide your treasures back then was to wrap it in a handkerchief. The safest way was always to bear it in the ground. The master also in 23 to 22 to 23 does not say that he is this person. He doesn't affirm that I'm the kind of person that you think I am. He's just basically saying by your own logic, by your own reasoning, your argument in a sense works against you that you are indeed a worthless and wicked slave. Verses 24 to 27, then the master said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to a master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who did not want me to reign over them, Bring them here and slay them in my presence. Well, let's go to our second discussion question. It would be interesting for you to compare what we learned in this account from Luke 19. But go back in comparison and read the account of the talents in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. And discuss amongst yourselves the similarities and the differences between these two parables before we wrap it up with some application. All right, let's go to our final point, three groups of people. As I stated earlier, there are only three types of people represented on this planet, and they can be broken down into the three categories that we see here in this parable. I'll present all three of them, but I want you to ask yourself, or think about it with yourself, as to which group you feel that you fall into. First of all, there are the haters, the haters. These people leave no doubt. They are completely overt in their behavior. They are vocal. They attack God without any remorse or concern. They attack God's people. They hate God. These are the people that we see in verse 14 
that said, we do not want this man to reign over us. That is most of society today. We don't want to submit to you, Jesus. You are not our creator. We don't believe the Bible is true. You are not Lord of our lives. I want to call the shots. And you, if you even exist, must play by my rules. If we stay with the uh, words in Psalm 118, Jesus is the stone. These would be the builders that rejected him. And what is their destiny? Very clear. Listen clearly. For those who reject Jesus, verse 27, they are enemies of God. These enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, did not want to submit to me as Lord, hated me, rejected me their entire lives, they are enemies Bring them here and slay them in my presence. Now, that sounds, of course, very harsh. But if you just got done reading Matthew 25, that's even more harsh. In Matthew 25, it says, Throw the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place, there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. We are talking an eternal hell in Matthew chapter 25 for rejecting the master. So those are the haters. Then there's the fakers. The fakers are the people that claim to have a relationship with Jesus. These are the people that claim to love Jesus. These are the people that go to church. These are the people that claim to be religious. Uh, These are the people that might not say anything even bad about Jesus. But in reality, now we're getting back to our sermon main point, there is no evidence of Christ working in their lives. These are the people that we see in the the story in Matthew where they come up to him and say all the amazing things that they supposedly did in his name. They even call him Lord. And Jesus says to them, you guys are fakers. Literally, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice wickedness. There's no results. There's no evidence of the king working in their lives. There's no desire on their part to truly honor the king. Jesus is there. If he works for them, fine. If not, you know what? He can sit on the sidelines. I'll live my life the way I choose to do. So thank you. There's no desire to submit to Jesus truly as a king, as a master, as a Lord of my life. And evidence of that, as I said, is there are no results. This person is the same person yesterday, three weeks ago, three years ago. You can't look at them if they were a tree and say there are, there's fruit of Jesus growing on the branches. Jesus brings results. There's no results in this person's life. Remember Zacchaeus? He gets saved and there is change. There is power at work. Now along these lines, it has encouraged me greatly that we are going through a very difficult time, maybe one of the most difficult times since I've been here in the life of our church. And what encourages me is the amount of fruit that I'm seeing from this congregation. Now, I'm not running around saying who's in and who's out. But what I'm saying is I'm observing Christians in a very difficult time displaying fruit. Still as much as possible, serving one another. Just saw a bunch of people yesterday work in the food bank here at our church. I'm hearing about people that are putting out signs of their own on their property with Bible verses, things they're trying to do to reach people for Jesus during these tough times. I've heard nobody from our church that is mad or complaining or upset with God, but everyone is trusting the Lord from what I've heard and is praising Jesus and walking fervently with him. I've seen our church, even when they're not asked to do so, meet together over the internet in all these different Zoom and Skype conversations. I think Pastor Barry said half the small groups right now are meeting still over the internet collectively. I'm seeing people send in their offerings. Again, don't know how much, but I know the number that we're getting each week. Giving is a regular part of our worship. This is being faithful with our minas. Just because church stops, we don't stop giving. In desperate times, we're really seeing a, a, a good opportunity for the, the fakers and the genuine Christians to sort of separate themselves. And it's a blessing for me as a pastor of this church to see so many genuine Christians show that they are truly genuine Christians in the way they are stewards of the minus that God has entrusted to their lives. Fakers put on a show. And although their rejection is much less blatant than the haters, They are still, verse 27, enemies of Jesus. 
and still they receive the same punishment that is reserved for the hater. And again, if someone thinks like, boy, that is really harsh. Um, I read an author this week that put it into great words. He said this, if one is filled with revulsion at the thought that such vengeance is ascribed to a savior whose love and tenderness are beyond all imagination and description, might not the solution be that these very attributes make hating and rejecting such a savior worthy of supreme retribution? Well, let's go to the last group. And of course, those would be the genuine believers. These are the ones that are entrusted with minas. And these are the ones that are faithful to do business for the Lord with the mina given to them. They grow. They multiply what God gives them. They use their time. They use their treasures. They use their talents for the glory of Jesus Christ. And they do not receive condemnation like the other two groups do, but rather as seen in this parable, they receive blessings. Verses 17 and 19, these guys get cities. I don't know how that's translated spiritually, but, but you, you get stuff. Verses 24 to 26, uh, they get more. Whoever doesn't have, they get less. Whoever has, they keep getting more. That's a, an indication of grace, how we just, we can't outgive God. That God just keeps blessing us and blessing us with abundant grace in our lives. They receive the Lord's affirmation. Verse 17, well done, good slave. So why don't you stop the video one more time and discuss amongst yourselves your thoughts regarding these three classifications of people that I presented to you. The haters, the fakers, and the genuine believer. So Jesus makes it clear in verse 11 that he is coming to Jerusalem. He is coming to Jerusalem this first time not to set up the earthly kingdom as the people expected, but rather he's coming to Jerusalem this first time, Isaiah 53, to be the suffering servant, to go to the cross, to lay his life down for his people. He did not come this first time to judge the world. He came to bring salvation to the world. As a matter of fact, on the cross, he is even begging for people that were crucifying him to be forgiven. But yet, make no mistake about it. For those who refuse to bow the knee to King Jesus, for those who refuse to acknowledge him as master, for those who do not give evidence of God bearing fruit in their lives to give reality and proof of their true salvation, there will be condemnation. Because Jesus Christ, as he's promised, will come back a second time and he will set up that kingdom and he will reward his servants and he will judge those who refuse to bow to his lordship. Let's pray. Father, all glory, dominion, honor, and majesty belong to you. You are ruler, you are king, you are master over those who love you and over those who rebel against you. We pray for the rebels, Lord, that during this time you would soften hearts and draw people to yourself. And we pray for those who claim to know you and love you as Savior and as Lord, that we have the assurance of our salvation based upon the way we are living our lives, which gives evidence, Lord, that we truly know that you are working in our lives. May we be found faithful. May we be a good servant. May we desire to hear those words from you as our master, to be used by you with all that we've been given, to give back to you, to see you through us receive the ultimate glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.